Matthew chapter 26. We, of course, are still dealing with the last week of our Lord's life on earth. It's called the Passion Week. And the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at Tuesday of the Passion Week, two days before the Passover. And last time we were together, as we began chapter 26 in verses 1 through 16, we looked at two things. Uh, We saw how Jesus had predicted his death for the fourth time. But unlike the previous predictions of his death, this time he linked it to the Passover, which of course we'll be looking at today. But the second thing we looked at involved Judas arranging the betrayal of Jesus with the high priest. He, of course, was given 30 pieces of silver, which is the price of a slave, thus fulfilling the prophecy from the book of Zechariah. Well, this brings us to verse 17 in our study for today. So let's pick up our reading in verse 17, and we'll read down through verse 30 in our time together. Matthew chapter 26 beginning in verse 17. Now, on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Then he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Well, then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives." Now, just a cursory reading of our text indicates we're going to be looking at the Passover. Uh, So if you're taking notes or outlining in our study today, we're going to look at two things in light of the Passover. In the first section, we'll look at the preparation for the Passover. That's in verses 17 through 25, the preparation for the Passover. The second thing we'll, we'll be looking at is the partaking of the Passover. Uh, That's in verses 26 through 30. So let's drop back and take a look at this first section. It deals with the preparation for the Passover. And there are five things to note in this first section in verses 17 through 25. Number one, the first and obvious thing involves the time of the Passover. The time of the Passover. Uh, Take a look at verse 17 again. In verse 17, it says, now on the first day of the feast of unleavened bread. Now, stop right there for just a moment, uh, because in Judaism, there are seven major feasts. And all seven of these major feasts look back, commemorating an event, and they look forward, celebrating an event. Now, the first of the seven feasts is Passover. It's on the 15th day of Nisan. It is a one-day feast. It looks back, commemorating the death of the Lamb whose blood was shed to cause the death angel to pass over. It, of course, looks forward celebrating the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because in 1 Corinthians 5-7, Paul said that Christ is our 
Passover. Now the second major feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread comes on the very next day after Passover, the 15th of Nisan, and it continues to the 21st day of Nisan. It's a seven day feast. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread looks back commemorating the urgency in which the children of Israel left Egypt. They left in such a hurry, they baked without leaven in their bread. It, of course, looks forward, celebrating the fact that there is no sin in Jesus, because leaven is a type of sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He knew no sin. Now, both of these first two feasts, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread run congruently. One day for Passover, the very next day, seven days for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So oftentimes in scripture, as we see right here in verse 17, they are used interchangeably. When you talk about the Feast of Unleavened Bread in verse 17, you also are talking about the Feast of the Passover because at the end of verse 17, they talk about eating the Passover. So both of these feasts were celebrated as one, if you will. Now the third feast in Judaism is the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits looks back commemorating the early barley harvest. It looks forward celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of those who've been raised from the dead. Now it's not that he is the first person who've ever been raised from the dead, but he is the first person who's been resurrected from the dead who never died again. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he is the first fruits. Now the fourth or middle feast is the feast of Pentecost or the feast of weeks. It looks back commemorating uh, the wheat harvest. It looks forward celebrating the birth of the church from Acts chapter 2. Now the fifth major feast is the Feast of Trumpets. Now the Feast of Trumpets, or uh, Rosh Hashanah, looks backward commemorating uh, the Jewish New Year. Uh, The Jewish New Year begins in the month of Tishri, it's September, October. It of course looks forward celebrating the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, uh, when Jesus Christ descends from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God blows and the dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds. Now, <clears throat> the sixth major feast is the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. It looks back commemorating the fact that the sins of Israel were atoned for as the priest went into the Holy of Holies on that one day and sprinkled the blood of the Lamb on the mercy seat, thus atoning for the sins of Israel. It looks forward celebrating the ultimate atonement for sin found in Jesus Christ. Read Hebrews chapter 9. Now the seventh and final feast is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. It looks back commemorating uh, God's provision and God's protection for the children of Israel while they were wandering 40 years in the wilderness. It looks forward celebrating the millennial kingdom, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. So all seven feasts look back commemorating an event and look forward celebrating an event. Now clearly there are two of these feasts that have yet to be celebrated and fulfilled Today, the Feast of Trumpets, which is the rapture of the church, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the millennial kingdom for the church. Now, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16, 16, we're told that there were three of the seven feasts that required mandatory attendance for every able-bodied male Jew. The first feast, Passover, which includes unleavened bread, they go hand in hand. The fourth and middle feast, Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, and the seventh and final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, or Booths. And I hope you're getting all this. There will be a test after class. So that is the, that is the time of the Passover. 
Back to Matthew chapter 26. Let's come to a second thing we want to look at. We said there were five. We've looked at the time of the Passover. Now let's take a look at the question about the Passover. The question about the Passover. That's in verse 17. Take a look. Let's just start at the beginning of the verse. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, and here's the question, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now, the question about the Passover seems very simple, very um, non, nothing assuming about it. Hey, Lord, where do you want us to go prepare the Passover? Very simple, very straightforward. But you know what struck me in this question about the Passover is that Jesus had nowhere to eat it. And I find that interesting because there are many religious groups today who say that Jesus was very rich, very wealthy. And they say, if we just had enough faith, then we too would be healthy and wealthy. They have it that name it and claim it, blab it and grab it kind of mentality. But you know, back in chapter 8 of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So clearly, Jesus didn't have big houses. Presumably, they didn't have a lot of money. You say, well, Clark, why is this so important for me? Well, I think there's a valuable lesson for us to be learned in all of this because while it is true, we all need things in the world. Look, we need food, we need clothing, we need shelter, transportation, communication. We need these things. We need medicines, we need this, we need help with that. I mean, there's a lot of things in the world that we need and we use on a regular basis, and that's okay. But the real question for us is, what is the priority in our life? Are we putting the world and the things of the world above our relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, in 1 John 2.15, uh, John said, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. For if you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are not of the Father, but they are of the world. And the world is passing away. So the question is, where do our priorities lie in life? What's our master passion in life? Hopefully, it's Jesus Christ. And second, it's the things of the world. You know, Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, he said to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I think there's an important lesson even in this question about the Passover. Number three. It it didn't really want to go up that easy. Uh, This one one I can do it, but not the left hand. Three. (laughs) But you know, I can do this though. Can you do that? Try it, Sean. See, you can't do that. The answer... (laughs) No donuts for you. The question, number three, the question regarding the Passover, the que- or the answer rather. We've looked at the question about the Passover. Now let's take a look at the answer regarding the Passover. I find this interesting. Look at verse 18. It says, and he, Jesus said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Now, here's the answer regarding the Passover. The question was, where are we going to eat it? The answer is simple. Jesus said, go into the city, go into Jerusalem. You're going to see a man, a certain man. We'll have Passover at his house. Now, remember, as we mentioned from Deuteronomy 16, 16, Passover, along with unleavened bread, required mandatory attendance for every male Jew. It is believed that there was upwards to one to two million people in and around Jerusalem at this time. So I would imagine when Jesus said, go into the city, you're going to see a certain man. They're going, oh, duh. <laughs> I mean, there's, it's, gonna, it's packed. It's wall-to-wall people. Now, we don't get it here, but we do find it in Luke's account. In Luke chapter 20, verse 10, Jesus said, you will find a certain man carrying a pitcher of 
of water. Now, this would be highly unusual because in ancient times, carrying pitchers of water was a job for the women, not the men. So a man carrying a pitcher of jug, a pitcher of water in a jug would stand out like a sore thumb in and around Jerusalem. Now, I find this interesting because this is something a man wouldn't do typically. So it points to and speaks of the fact that Jesus is omniscient. Jesus Christ knows everything about everyone all the time. And that should scare the far out of all of us. He knows what you're thinking right now and you better knock it off. Hey, look, we're not hiding anything from... You know, we do a pretty good job of hiding things from people, do we not? I mean, we hide things from our friends, our coworkers, our family members. I mean, after all, they're not that bright. But we ain't hiding nothing from God. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from His sight. All things are naked and open to him to whom we must give an account. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees the good and the evil. Look, we're not pulling the wool over God's eyes. And just because we haven't experienced any consequences to our sin, to our actions, please don't think that somehow God didn't see it, or God doesn't know about it, or somehow he's winked at it. No, there will be a price to pay for sin one day to be sure. Well, we don't get it here, but in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 14, verse 15, we're told that they went to a large upper room that was furnished and prepared. So apparently, the disciples did not have much preparation to do for the Passover meal because whoever this certain man was who was carrying a water jug on his head had it all taken care of already. Back to Matthew chapter 26. Let's come to a fourth matter. We said there were five. And that involves the preparation for the Passover. Number four, the preparation for the Passover. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, it says, So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now here it says the disciples. Uh, Luke chapter 22 verse 9 tells us there were two disciples that were sent to do this task. It was Peter and John. And this large upper room where they were to have the Passover meal that Peter and John went to scope out and to finish the preparations for would be the upper room where Jesus would give his famous upper room discourse from John chapters 13 through 17. Now, that upper room discourse wasn't all in the upper room. Presumably in John chapter 15, they left the upper room and they walked across the Temple Mount area because Jesus talked about how he was the vine, his fa- and we're the branches. And we'll talk more about that in John chapter 15 in about four years. Uh, No, three, three, excuse me. First service said four years. No, just kidding. (laughs) Okay, some of us might not be around that long, Sean. That's the point, okay? Don't laugh at that. You're going to be old like us one day. But the point is, the point is, this is that upper room where that famous upper room discourse occurred. Well, let's come to the fifth and final thing, and we'll finish up this first point dealing with the preparation for the Passover. Number five, and finally, it involves the betrayal at the Passover. The betrayal at the Passover. That's in verses 20 through 25. In Matthew 26, 20, it says, Now when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now when it talks about evening coming, this marks the beginning of the next day. You know, we calculate our days beginning at midnight. 1201 starts the next day for us. Follow me? But the Jews start their next day in the evening. 
And they get that from the book of Genesis in Genesis chapter 1, verse 15. During the six days of creation, it says the evening and the morning were the first day. And then the, on the second day, the evening and the morning were the second day. So even today, the Jews begin their day in the evening, or what we might call sunset. Now, technically, uh, in Israel, when you walk outside in the evening and you see three stars in the sky, that marks the beginning of the next day. And this will become very important as it pertains to his death and resurrection. And we'll talk more about that in our subsequent studies. Verse 21, it says, Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Wow. Now we know from verse 25 and back in verse 14 that Judas Iscariot is the betrayer. We know that. But here we're told that all the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, is it I? Kind of interesting. It really speaks to the fact that these guys didn't even know their own heart. You know, we like to think we got it all together. I mean, come on, we go to Calvary Chapel. <laughs> Follow me? That somehow we're right on and, and we've got it all together. Hey, are you kidding me? We're all messed up. Okay, four of us up front. Okay, fine. Uh, the rest of you are very holy and spiritual and, and you're dismissed. But boy, talk about our heart. We don't even know our own heart. I, I will never forget, I was, I was talking to a pastor many years ago um, about an issue in the Bible that, that I, I just thought he was off on and I just wanted to ask him and talk to him about it and, and in love, correct him. <laughs> because I was right and he was wrong. And, he's, and I, was, I was showing in the scripture and I'll never forget, he stopped me and said, you don't know my heart. I said, well, you know, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, your heart is deceitful of all things and exceedingly wicked. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like that. <laughs> but look, none of us know even our own. You know, it was, it was Charles Hayden Spurgeon who said, the moment I step out of this pulpit, I'm capable of the most heinous sin possible. Listen, gang, this is a real wake-up call for all of us. When we think we've got it all together and we're just walking down the narrow road, praising the Lord, thinking that somehow we're so much better than everybody else because, <laughs> you know, hey, watch out, be careful. Because at any given moment, man, our heart, our flesh can kick in. And, and all of us are battling the flesh, by the way. We all battle the flesh. We battle the world, Satan, and the flesh. We have three things working against us daily. In Romans chapter 7, Paul understood this. He says, I don't do the things I want to do, and I do the things I don't want to do. Oh, wretched man, who will deliver me from this body of death? <laughs> now, if that was Paul, can you imagine about us, okay? Here is a guy who wrote about one-third of the New Testament telling us how messed up he is. And the moment we think we're not messed up, man, watch out, take heed, Beware. Back to Matthew chapter 26. This section continues. Look at verse 23. Dealing with the betrayal at the Passover, look at verse 23. It says, Then he answered and said, He who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now, in ancient times, they, of course, did not have silverware like we have, forks and knives and such. Um, there were common bowls of of vegetables, common bowls of sauces and soups and, and dipping material like hummus and whatnot. And they would have a common loaf of bread and usually a common loaf of a, a, a chunk of meat. And you would grab the loaf of bread and tear a piece off and hand it to the person next to you and they would tear a piece off and they would put it in the, the dipping sauce or whatever it was, the hummus, and take a bite. And, and by the way, there were no double dipping rules back then. <laughs> and they would dip it again and take another bite. You know, I remember the first time I had a, a meal with Colonel Shalom Almog, full bird colonel in the Israeli Defense Force, um, 
Sally and I were having dinner with him and his wife, Irit, and in typical Israeli fashion, at just about every uh, restaurant you go to, they bring out all these dishes of all these different vegetables and different sauces and different hummuses, and they would bring out the pita bread. And I'll never forget, Shalom grabs a pita bread, he tears it in half, and hands me half of it. And the first thing I thought, did he wash his hands? I mean, why are you touching the bread that's going to go in my mouth? And then, true story, he takes his pita, dips it in the hummus, reaches in and grabs some vegetable, puts it on and takes a bite, and he d- dipped it again. He double dipped. Apparently, he had no idea there was no double dipping allowed. And I was kind of grossed out at that at first. But I had no choice but to dip behind him and eat it. He goes, here, try some hummus. I go, no, I'm okay. He goes, no, it's good, try it. I go, I I don't think so. And I finally, he finally, there's no saying no to him. So I finally dipped it out. Yeah, that's good. Follow me? But by the end of the meal, man, we were all reaching with our hands and dipping. And here, try this. You know, it's putting it in my mouth and I'm going. So in ancient times, Much like today, uh, it's totally acceptable, and it wasn't a big deal. And here, the dipping in is, they were dipping in together. Now, John tells us in John chapter 13, verse 26, that when Jesus dipped in, he actually gave Judas the bread, because he, of course, would be the betrayer. And that is when Satan entered the heart of Judas. Well, verse 24, this section goes on. It says, the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Now, it's written of the Messiah. It's speaking of his demise, his death, his suffering. Uh, Isaiah 53, 8 talks about his suffering. Uh, Daniel 9, 26 talks about his death. Again, in Zechariah 13, 7, and throughout the Old Testament. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been, uh, not yet been born. Then Judas, who was the betrayer, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? <laughs> and he said to him, you have said it. All the disciples, Rabbi, is it I? Teacher, is it me? But Judas didn't want to be the odd man out. Even though he knew he was the betrayer, he said, Lord, is it me? And Jesus, of course, responds in the affirmative, yes, it is. Well, back to Matthew 26. Let's come to the second and final thing we want to look at, and we'll start winding this down right here. We've looked at the preparation for the Passover. Now let's take a look at the partaking of the Passover. That's in verses 26 through 30, the partaking of the Passover. And we would mention five things in this second section. Number one, Uh, First of all, let's take a look at the bread of the Passover. The bread of the Passover. That's the first thing that's mentioned. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now notice the first thing Jesus did. He took the bread and blessed it. Now, this is typically where we get the idea of asking God to bless our food. When we sit down to eat, we ask God to bless the food we're about to eat, and and it's very normal and very, very uh, common for us to do. However, I think it might be just a little presumptuous for us to ask God to bless some of our food. I've seen some of the food we eat. I think we should just thank God for it, eat it and take our chances. I mean, I, I, God bless this food. I can see God going, you want me to bless that? I mean, are you kidding? So, I, I, but this is where we get this idea of asking God to bless our food. Now, uh, the bread that's being mentioned here is of course the matzah. When we think of bread, we think of some, a big fluffy loaf. No, remember they left Israel, uh, they left Egypt in such a hurry they baked without leaven. So the matzah is more of a cracker, if you will. And Jesus said, take and eat, this is my 
body. Now, obviously, he's speaking metaphorically. He is not speaking literally or, um, uh, you know, he's speaking symbolically as he did back in John 6, 48. He said, I am the bread of life. He talks about eating his uh, body and drinking his blood. Clearly, that is not the case. Um, no, the matzah is that flat cracker. And, and, during, and this is what we do for communion, by the way. We call it communion uh, because, as we'll see in a moment, with the cup, he gave thanks. It's called the Eucharist or the giving of thanks. Um, but the bread becomes significant for three reasons. And when we pull out a sheet of matzah out of the box, it becomes pretty apparent. The first reason is because it's baked without leaven. Now, leaven in Scripture is a type of sin, as we mentioned earlier in our study. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, uh, Paul said, Purge out the leaven from among you that you might become a new lump. So leaven is a type of sin. And Jesus, of course, had no sin. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he knew no sin. Uh, 1 John 3.5 says in him is no sin. Hebrews 4.15 says he is without sin. He is the sinless, spotless lamb of God. 1 Peter 1.18 and 19. But the second reason the matzah is so important is when you pull it out and look at it, it's pierced. There's holes in it. And according to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, the Bible says, oh, or, or in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, excuse me, it says they'll look on him whom they have pierced, Zechariah 12, 10. But there's a third reason the matzah is important, and that's because it's striped. As you see the stripes on it, Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we are healed. Now, he might not heal us physically, but he'll for sure heal, heal us spiritually. So the matzah becomes a very important point, pointing to and speaking of the body of our Lord. Now, this brings us to a second thing we want to look at. We've looked at the bread of the Passover. Now let's take a look at the cup of the Passover. The cup of the Passover. Now look at verse 27. Verse 27. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Now, the cup becomes significant. In fact, during the Passover meal, there are actually four cups. Uh, the first cup is called the Kadush, or the cup of blessing. The second cup is called the Makat, or the cup of plagues. The third cup is called the Hagula, or the cup of redemption. The fourth cup is called the Hallel, or the cup of praise. Now, all four cups are, are drank or drink, yeah, uh, during the various points of the meal. Now, we're not told here, but in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 22, 20, we're told after supper, Jesus took the cup. Now, after supper always comes the third cup the Hagulah, or the cup of redemption. And that's the cup that Jesus lifted because only Jesus Christ could redeem us, purchase us, buy us out from under sin, death, and hell itself. But note carefully, class, in verse 27, at the end it says, Jesus said, drink from it, all of you. Now, at this point, according to John chapter 13, verse 30, Judas had already left. So when Jesus said, drink it, all of you, he was speaking to the believers, to the 11, those who were true followers of Jesus Christ. And I think this becomes important for two reasons. Number one, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, the Bible says when we partake of communion, when we receive the bread in the cup, if we don't do it in a worthy manner, in other words, if we're not saved, if we're not truly a, a child of God, many, it says in 1 Corinthians, many drink it and are sick and die. So there is an element of holiness, if you will, to the partaking of the elements. But I think second, it's significant because Jesus said, drink it, all of you. 
There are religious groups today who don't allow you to partake of the cup. You know, I had built um, a really beautiful Catholic church uh, in the city of Walnut there in L.A. It was called St. Lorenzo's Catholic Church. Uh, St. Lorenzo was one of the pa patron saints of the Philippines. It was a beautiful facility, a giant sanctuary, a, um, a place for the priest, the school. I mean, it was just a beautiful, beautiful facility, all split face block, all exposed, it, big beams. It was killer. Uh, but, but, during the grand opening, Sally and I were there for the grand opening of it, and it was a big deal. Cardinal Mahoney was there, the big cheese, uh, the newspaper. There were there was there was uh, cameras there, TV crews, and and Sally and myself and a bunch of other apparently very wealthy, important people were sitting right up in a front section that was kind of roped off, and then everybody else was out in the congregation. Well, the priest gets up to do communion. And he's standing on this big platform, and, and, some of, and we got to take it first because, you know, we're special and important, unlike everybody else. God help us. <laughs> and Sally nudges me. She's going, I'm not going up there. I'm not going up there. I go, Sally, you got to go up there. You're in the special seated section. She goes, I'm not going up there. Because the priest, he was standing on this big box, had the big hat, the robe, and the people from the special section were lining up, and he would, he would be standing there looking down at everybody, and they would come up with their hands down and their tongue out, like that. And he said, this is the body of Christ, and put the wafer on their tongue. I thought, well, that's creepy. <laughs> and Sally goes, there's no way I'm going up there. There's no way. I go, Sally. So I go, I'll go for the both of us. I'll bite the bullet. I will never forget this. I, I'm walking up, I'm walking up, and the guy's looking down at me. He's had these crazy eyes, and he was, it was like vine, veins were popping out, and he's going, this is the body of Christ. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> it's a cracker. He put, but the point was, only the priest got to drink from the cup. None of us people got to drink from the cup. Only the priest, which I find very interesting in light of what Jesus said in verse 27, drink from it, all of you. We need to be very careful to make sure we do what the Bible says and not follow the traditions or the dogma of man or church ideology, but follow the word of of God. Well, let's come to a third matter. We have to hurry. The third issue deals with the new covenant of the Passover. The new covenant of the Passover. Take a look at verse 28. In verse 28, Jesus said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood for the whole world. But obviously the whole world won't accept it. The whole world won't receive it. So his blood was shed for the many who would receive it. That's the idea, obviously. Now, Jesus takes the Passover meal and he transforms it into what we call the Lord's Supper. Ultimately, communion. The bread and the cup. Now, Jesus didn't nullify the Passover. He fulfilled it. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. Now, it's kind of interesting here because we're looking at two covenants. The old covenant is a blood covenant. It dealt with the law. But the new covenant is a blood covenant. It deals with grace. So what's the difference? The difference is in the blood. The blood of the old covenant covenant was the blood of bulls and goats. And interestingly enough, in the Old Testament, the word atonement is the Hebrew word kova, kova, or hat. And a hat covers. So the word kova means to cover. So in the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats only covered our sin. But Jesus' blood paid for our sin. 
And it was through his shed blood that our sins are removed, forgiven and forgotten, 1 John 1, 9, Hebrews 10, 17. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away our sin. Colossians 1.14 says you and I are redeemed by the blood of Christ. And that's how you and I are washed, white as snow. You know, Jasmine sang that old hymn this morning. I remember it uh, like yesterday, Pastor Chuck used to lead us in singing the hymns on Sunday morning. And, and this is one he sang oftentimes. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Number four, real quickly. Let's take a look at the fourth issue, and that's the statement of the Passover. The statement of the Passover. Take a look at verse 29. But I say to you, verse 29, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine and obviously eat of the bread from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So they had no doubt completed the entire meal as every good Jewish man would. And Jesus, Luke twenty two fifteen, 15, had a fervent desire to eat this meal with him before he suffers and dies, the Bible says. But he will, he will eat it with them again. And that is in his Father's kingdom. Now, scholars are divided as to exactly when Jesus is talking about. However, I personally think and believe, and this is my own personal opinion, I could be wrong. That it points to and speaks of the millennial kingdom. Because in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, the Bible talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 is when Jesus comes back, his second coming at the end of the seven years of tribulation and establishes the millennial kingdom. And I personally think the marriage supper of the Lamb happens for a thousand years on earth for two reasons. Number one, the Old Testament saints, those who died by faith in the Old Testament, are not resurrected till the end of the seven years of tribulation, according to Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. But second, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, the Bible says that you and I are going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a Jew Jewish euphemism for eating. And how can we sit down and eat with them until they're raised from the dead at the end of the seven years of tribulation? So I do not believe the marriage supper of the Lamb is for seven years in heaven. I think it's for a thousand years on earth. And I believe that is when Jesus will once again partake of this Passover meal, we might say, the bread and the cup. Well, number five and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. Let's take a look at the hymn of the Passover. I like this, the hymn of the Passover. In verse 30, it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, this was very customary, very typical after the Passover meal was totally complete. Oftentimes, the entire family would stand up and they would sing a hymn, usually a um, one of the Hallel Psalms from Psalm 115 through Psalm 118. And this is one reason uh, why we sing a hymn at the end of our service together. We too stand up and we sing a hymn and we're dismissed. People ask me, why do we sing a song at the end of the service? Well, Jesus did. And I think if Jesus did it, we should probably do it too. Not out of tradition, not out of ritual or rite, but just following the example of our Lord. And family, that should be the case. Listen, gang, that should be the case in each and every aspect of our lives, following the example of Jesus. Father, we are so grateful, so thankful for these few minutes together. Lord, an opportunity yet again just to study your word, to learn of you, to worship you through the study of your word. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would help each and every one of us just to follow in your footsteps. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together?